does TRT cause gyno or maybe we should ask can it cause gyno? Okay, so welcome back to the TRT and Hormone Optimization YouTube channel and back with us as a guest is Gil T. Welcome back, Gil. Thank you, Stephen. I really appreciate it as always. Welcome back. Today, let's talk about gyno. The typical question in the YouTube search bar is does TRT cause gyno or maybe we should ask can it cause gyno? Okay, so first we have to understand what gynecomastia is. So let's preface this by saying that Gynecomastia is the development of breast tissue in males, and it is often unwanted, and there are a number of reasons why this can occur. So before we can treat any condition, right, we first have to diagnose it. So the diagnosis for gynecomastia is not something that you can do at home. It is not the sensitivity around your nipples. It is not an increase in what you perceive to be breast tissue or an increase in necessarily in, in the size of your chest or the softness of your chest. These are things that need to be diagnosed clinically. Oftentimes guys have a little too much fat around their chest area and they misconstrue this for gynecomastia when in fact it is not. So it is very important to distinguish. Uh, with that said, uh, one of the studies that I'm gonna reference, and there are three that I've looked at recently, one of them uh, actually stated a statistic, which I found quite interesting, that up to 30% of males at some point in their life are going to be affected uh, from gynecomastia, 30%, three out of 10 men. And it went on to uh, refer to the prevalence of gynecomastia being most prominent uh, around three different times of your life. One is immediately after birth, while there's still uh, high levels of female hormones circulating from the mother. The second time, as we've known, uh, to be true is during puberty, when the hormonal milieu of a male is off balance. And that's usually when they break out in acne and have significant changes. And then the third time, which I found interesting, although not surprising, is during old age. And one of the studies goes specifically into detail why this is relevant, because what we know about men as they age is they generally become hypogonadal and suffer low testosterone. So let's refer to the first study, which I will pull up a, a figure to explain specifically what goes on during gynecomastia. Okay, so if we look at this image here on the screen, and this here is from a study from last year, from 2023, this is the Swerdloff study, uh, which is, less than a year old. It was done during the summer of 2023. You'll notice a number of things that are required for gynecomastia to occur or essentially for the development of breast tissue. Now, breast tissue uh, can be areolar. It could be ducts. It could be glandular. It could be various different aspects that form breasts. But ultimately, a well-developed breast is essentially all of the above. So if you look at the First one on the left, which always takes the brunt of the blame, it is estrogen. But what's interesting here is you'll notice that estrogen is essentially responsible for the ductal growth or, or the milk ducts. So the growth of the ducts and development of the ducts in a normal breast formation is mostly mediated by estrogen. Now, if we walk over to the right on the graph, you'll notice the growth hormone, specifically IGF-1, is what induces the actual growth of the gland, okay? And then you look at progesterone, which is responsible for the areole, uh, areolar uh, development around the nipples. And then prolactin, as we know, is a prolactating hormone, which is responsible for the formation of breast milk. So all four of these must be present in order for proper breast development. There's a fifth aspect, which is not referred to in the study, but I've harped on this many times over the years, which is a genetic predisposition, right? Hormones are different in the way they affect different people. Genetic predisposition is essentially very important. You can have someone who is more sensitive to these aspects. You can have someone who is unaffected by these aspects. But what's interesting here is if we go down to the bottom of the screen and you look at the testosterone, and right below it says inhibitory action on breast tissue. What does this mean? It means that a proper androgen level in and of itself, free testosterone, is protective of this environment that we see to the north of this model, 
which means that when you have optimal T levels, these other hormones require even more of them in order to overpower the testosterone. And this is interesting because we know from the bodybuilding world, generally guys do not develop gynecomastia while they're on their cycles, but as they're coming off their cycle, there is a perfect storm, if you will, where androgen levels are low, SHBG tends to rise up, therefore binding on more of the free testosterone, and that is secondary to serum use like clomiphene, tamoxifen, et cetera. It binds up more testosterone, even though it increases LH, it grossly increases SHBG. And one of the studies actually touched on SHBG elevating during age, thus lowering free testosterone and therefore making it easier for these other uh, hormones like uh, prolactin, progesterone, et cetera, to overdominate. So this is an interesting model here. For those that are interested, we'll have the study in the in the in the bottom. Uh, but this is a 2023 study, uh, gynecomastia, etiology, diagnosis, and treatment. Etiology is essentially the cause. Diagnosis is obvious, and then how do we treat it? So this is a good study um, to to look over. Okay. So this second study here is out of Turkey. It's a 2014 study, so it is about 10 years old now. This is the one that stated that at least 30% of males will be affected during their life, which I found to be a pretty alarming number. Um, but essentially, this goes on uh, statistically to explain the different mechanisms of gynecomastia and essentially the, the number of men that are affected. Now, this third study is extremely interesting because it does touch on a couple other points that I think a lot of people uh, would realize uh, that they're probably affected by. So this study was done by the University of Milan, the urological department, and this is a 2021 study. Now, this is a meta-analysis of 32 different studies that were collected. And it talks about the pharmacological or drug-induced gynecomastia. And I think a lot of people would find it interesting that spirulinactone or aldactone, which is a frequently prescribed diuretic, and we know we use it in, uh, in females with PCOS specifically to block the androgen receptor activity. Uh, it is known to be an, an anti-androgen. Uh, and in fact, it increases the prevalence of gynecomastia in men who are on spirulinactone. And the reason for that is, again, the protective nature of androgens uh, is then inhibited, and then the other hormones that we discussed earlier have an opportunity to overcome that environment and start the process. The other one is finasteride, which a lot of guys are obviously familiar with as well. It is a DHT blocker or a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, uh, and that is another one that is mentioned in this study. For those that do wish to look a little deeper at, the, uh, at these studies, the, the links are going to be down below in the description. Uh, but this is a fairly uh, fairly new study from um, 2021 as well. So you have to uh, you have to understand that gynecomastia is not as uncommon as people may think, but it is also very preventable if you understand that it is not estrogen that is causing it. it is a combination of low androgens. Low androgens is not just your total testosterone. Low free androgens can be an elevation of SHBG, which then binds free testosterone, allowing prolactin, IGF-1, progesterone, and some circulating estrogen, which again is only responsible for the ductal portion, um, to overpower the androgen effect. So usually what I find in guys who do have genuine gynecomastia is a number of factors in common. Number one, they usually were affected by this condition during puberty at some point, or They've already been diagnosed and potentially treated via surgery to remove the gland. However, some of the gland was left behind. These people have already proven to be more susceptible. And then third, we often find elevated prolactin levels, elevated progestin levels, and usually it's a result of previous um, anabolic steroid abuse. And then generally we will find high SHBG in some of the older guys, which leads to low free testosterone or they're simply suppressed, or they're just hypogonadal and untreated. Very rarely, if at all, I, I honestly can't think of a situation where I found a man on properly administered and properly managed testosterone replacement therapy who's presented with actual gynecomastia. As I said earlier, it is usually just their manifestation in their head where they think, well, this is gyno because my nipples are a little sensitive or I have a little fatty tissue around the breast area, and, and very seldomly is that truly 
diagnosed as gynecomastia. So there's a lot of misconceptions. And estrogen is, is always, always gets the blame. People think they need an aromatase inhibitor in order to reduce the risk of gynecomastia. And that is simply just not the case. Mm -hmm. So if older men with uh, gynecomastia on TRT uh, don't see improvement after a while on the proper protocol, uh, what do they do? Certain um, treatments? Older men generally don't really present with this if they've never had it before, but if they do, once they're on TRT, which is very uncommon, because remember, as the study suggested, in older men, it is usually a result of low testosterone, which is inhibitory of gynecomastia. Uh, but if they do, it's likely an IGF-1 slash genetic predisposition slash prolactin issue, and they're probably on some sort of a DHT inhibitor like finasteride or dutasteride from the urologist, whether it's to treat BPH or if they are concerned about hair loss. So usually, again, they're blocking the mechanism of the protective action of androgens. I've personally never experienced it because none of our patients are any of these medications. You mentioned um, sensitive nipples. Is that something that is typical or um, temporary starting TRT? Yeah, so both. It is extremely common when starting testosterone. And in fact, so much so that we warn patients in advance. Otherwise, we know we're going to get a call in a couple of weeks saying, I've gotten a comastia. But in essence, when you do begin testosterone replacement, you are going to have a an initial spike in androgens. You're going to have some delayed response in metabolites. And your entire hormone homeostatic state is going to need to adjust for a matter of a couple of months before that subsides. So very common to feel a different sensation in sensitive areas that are known to be sensitive to hormonal fluctuations, such as the nipples. Uh, so it is very common. And yes, it generally will subside in 95% of patients. And when it doesn't, then we just have a physical assessment. But like I said, I've never seen true gynecomastia as a result of properly administered TRT, unless there are ancillaries or other conditions involved. Okay. Thank you so much, Gil, for clearing this out. My pleasure. Thank you.